Hello. I want to echo my colleagues' thanks um, to the Research and Publications Department, uh, to Director Mari for inviting me to take part in this uh, wonderful symposium. I feel very honored to be on this distinguished panel of uh, speakers, um, and I'm really excited to continue the conversation. In his landmark 1969 exhibition, Live or Live in Your Head, When Attitudes Become Form, Swiss curator Harold Zeman displayed works that explored the intersections between thought, form, and action. Works by Richard Serra, Michael Heiser, and others emphasized transitional states of matter, the transformation of materials, and the tra translation of artistic idea into objects and actions. What resulted was a critical and self-conscious reflection on the processes of art making and exhibition that in many ways destroyed existing notions of what it meant to make and exhibit art, and even to curate an exhibition. In thinking about the current and future of archival collections, a similar rumination on transitional states, material transformation, and even destruction of existing paradigms is, I would argue, entirely appropriate. Particularly as archives collect materials created and compiled since the 1970s, many of the traditional approaches to processing, access, and even archival research itself are being challenged by the changing nature of these collections. How does an archivist provide access to an envelope full of colored powder or photographic negatives spooled onto a motion picture reel? What happens when archives do and don't become form? As post-1970s collections make up a growing proportion of archival acquisitions, we must contend with these changes and must consider the ramifications not only of digital collections, but of digitized access to collections. Advances in technologies of information storage and retrieval have, in many ways, precipitated these challenges. However, such technologies also provide new tools for confronting them and for conducting research on contemporary collections. In my talk today, I will, further, I will explore further the challenges and the opportunities that face those who manage archival collections, especially those covering the modern and contemporary period, but also those who conduct research in or exhibit from such collections. As the Digital Humanities Specialist at the Getty Research Institute, or GRI, I oversee the digital art history team whose role it is to understand and articulate these barriers to access and to discover new ways of doing research. My team works at the intersection of multiple fields, including curation, archival processing, library and information science, technical imaging, and software development. Our goal is to ensure the technology the GRI deploys suits the needs of researchers but also that researchers understand how to navigate the partially digitized archives that result. Thus, in our inherently collaborative work, the digital art history team seeks to understand and represent the perspectives of all those who compile, process, and access archival collections. I will begin my remarks today by focusing on three collections that the GRI has acquired over the last few years, and which have also been the focus of digital art history projects. The first example is the archive and library of Swiss curator Harold Zeman, acquired in 2011. The second is that uh, artist Ed Ruscha's Streets of Los Angeles archive, acquired in 2012. And the third is the first part of the archive of architect Frank O. Geary, comprising projects executed from 1954 to 1988 which was acquired by the GRI just last year in 2017. These three collections reflect the collecting focus of the GRI. Many of you might know that the J. Paul Getty Trust is made up of four programs. The Getty Foundation, which gives grants to external organizations. The Getty Conservation Institute, focused on conservation science. 
the J. Paul Getty Museum, and Getty Research Institute. Whereas the Getty Museum primarily collects artworks and artifacts made prior to 1900, the GRI is a library and an archive and focuses its collection more on the modern and contemporary era. Moreover, the GRI acquires materials that other institutions are less likely to collect, in some cases because of the inherent challenges they present to providing access. Examples of these kinds of materials include those related to performance art, conceptual art, architecture and design, and video art. In addition to reflecting the GRI's focus areas, the Zeman, Ruche, and Gary collections also represent some of the most critical issues facing contemporary collection practice. The rapidly expanding scale and scope of archival collections, the growing need for researchers themselves to become more sophisticated in their techniques of search and discovery, the transformations of collection into data. I would like to describe some of the projects related to these archives that the digital art history team has worked on in the past few years, projects that were designed to address the hurdles to access and research these collections present. The Harold Zeman Archive and Library together contain about one kilometer or 3,000 linear feet of materials. The challenges presented by the size of the Zeman collection are compounded by the scope of the materials found in it. In addition to materials like thermal fax paper, as well as born digital items, such as Zeman's emails, the archive contains bottles of liquid, including olive oil. An example of James Lee Byers' mail art, comprising envelopes filled with colored powder, seeds, and glitter. Due to both its size and the diversity of the objects included within it, the archival processing of the Zeman archive was a resource-intensive, time-consuming, and complicated undertaking, which required hiring additional staff to complete. The collection is so large, two separate finding aids were created for it. Now, finding aids are the indices of archival collections. These indices are used by researchers to browse the boxes and folders that make up the archive. Um, and also used to order the specific items from it that the researchers wish to consult. Usually there's only one arch finding archive aid per collection. A campaign to digitize a significant portion of the Zeman archive was conducted during archival processing. Digitization does not, however, equal access. That is, because, just because items are available in digital forms does not automatically make these e items easy for researchers to find. Thus, as a way of understanding how researchers might navigate this extremely large and complex archive, the digital art history team oversaw the Zeman Digital Seminar, which joined three graduate courses that took place at the University of California, Los Angeles, the University of Chicago, and the Academy of Visual Arts in Leipzig, Germany. For the digital seminar, the digital art history team worked closely with the GRI's software development team to prototype a tool intended to access all of the GRI's archival collections, beginning with the Zeman archive. This tool was designed to be a kind of navigable finding aid, allowing researchers to browse both digitized and non-digitized portions of the Zeman collection. The tool we built as a prototype helped us to articulate a number of uh, questions we had not considered when we began the project. Um, and I should note this tool is not publicly accessible. It is only a prototype and still being developed. Chief among these questions was that of the continuing relevance and utility of the finding aid. While students and professors taking part in the digital seminar appreciated the advanced access to the digitized portions of the collection, they felt overwhelmed by the complexity and scale of the archive itself. 
They often had difficulty finding individual folders or items. And they also had difficulty understand the, understanding the relationship between individual items and the archive as a whole. Such relationships are arguably easier to understand when one is physically at the archive and, over the course of days, can co slowly come to understand it as a whole. The use of the archival finding aid by itself and for digital-only access did not seem to be a wholly sufficient means of understanding the collection. The archival finding aid is, after all, a tool designed to facilitate physical access. However, in an environment wherein archival access is increasingly hybrid, that is, both digital and physical, and is sometimes only digital, we began to wonder if we might need to reconceptualize the finding aid. Is it time to fundamentally rethink it to devise a completely new approach for archival search that is more suited to the hybrid physical and digital access that archives increasingly require. Los Angeles-based artist Ed Ruscha's Streets of Los Angeles Archive is also a collection of significant size, comprising over a half million images to date. This archive is the result of Ruscha's systematic documentation since the 1960s of several of Los Angeles' major thoroughfares, including Hollywood Boulevard, Melrose Avenue, and of course, Sunset Boulevard. The project was initiated in the 1960s and continues to this day. The result is a trove of images that record the distinctive elements of the Los Angeles cityscape, such as its building facades, typologies, and street signage. Many of these images were shot onto motion picture film stock and subsequently spooled onto film reels, primarily for ease of storage. Of course, this presents a barrier to researcher access, since it is not feasible for us to check out to researchers spools of film stock containing negatives for thousands of images. The only way these images can be made accessible is therefore through their digitization. Accordingly, the GRI has undertaken to digitize a selection from this archive, a project that has ultimately yielded over 120,000 images. As part of a digital art history project associated with the archive, the digital art history team is once again working with the Getty's software engineers to further develop the same user interface we prototyped for the Zeman archive. Once again, scale presents significant hurdles to search and navigation. How to enable researchers to find their way through hundreds of thousands of images? One approach we are using to facilitate search is tagging each image in the corpus with geospatial information. Because Ruscha and his team took a systematic approach to their photography of the streets, snapping the camera at regular and predictable intervals, we are able, working with a contractor, to auto-generate precise location information for each image. This would allow a scholar to search a reel of these images by street address. This project is still in development, but what we envision is that a scholar might want to search for images of 8901 Sunset Boulevard, for example. That's the location of the famous rock club Whiskey A Go Go, across multiple reels of photographs. As part of this project, we are also exploring how researchers might navigate and analyze not a collection of single photographs, but what is conceived of by its creator, Ed Ruscha, as a corpus of images. Since Heinrich Wolflin's 1915 work, The Principles of Art History, art historians have famously focused on side-by-side -side comparison of two images. Ruscha's Streets of Los Angeles Archive, by contrast, Ask the scholar to consider thousands of images at once. What does it mean to research such a corpus? And moreover, what would it mean to publish scholarship that is illustrated with not just tens or hundreds, but with thousands of images? In addition to exploring how scholars of Ruscha or conceptual art might want to research this collection, we are also taking the opportunity to explore ways scholars from other fields might research it. 
We are thus investigating the other kinds of data this archive can be leveraged to uncover. Once geospatial metadata is tagged to each image, we can use this to link to tax assessor data, for example, that would tell a scholar when a particular building was built, who might have owned it, or how much it was worth. A key focus of this project, therefore, is considering what other kinds of research applications we might envision for this or other collections. What visual, textual, or quantitative information will be meaningful to research? How might the data generated from this body of work be leveraged in innovative ways? As large as both the Zeman and Ruche archives are, the Franco-Gary archive is even larger. The Gary Archive includes around 120,000 of the architect's working drawings, more than 100,000 slides, a number of born digital materials, such as computer-aided design or CAD files, and 380 partial and complete architectural models, among other materials. These models are particularly relevant for research on Frank Gary because of their importance to his overall design process. For example, asked for his thoughts on architectural models as part of a 2002 interview, Gary replied, quote, the models are a way of studying. It's the way of working I feel most comfortable with. That's how I design. In fact, for Gary, models come first, even before drawings, and function as physical sketches. The Gary acquisition adds to the GRI's already sizable collection of architectural models raising the overall total to around 700. These models are difficult to provide access to because of their size and because they're often made of fragile materials. The digital art history team, working in collaboration with the GRI's curator of architecture and the Getty's technical imaging specialist, has begun exploring how 3D imaging of these and other models might facilitate broader access to our entire collection of models. However, these imaging technologies are still in development. And moreover, no single approach or technique will be suitable for all types of models. For example, depending on their physical characteristics and how the resulting images will be used, some models might be imaged using photogrammetry. Photogrammetry uh, uses 2D photographic images to create a map of the surface points on an object. Other models, even within the same archive or collection, might require a different approach, say one based on laser scanning. That is, bouncing laser light off the object to record its surface. Developing a more nuanced and sophisticated understanding of the research applications for 3D images of architectural models is critical for determining, determining technical standards and best practices for imaging. However, precisely because models are not widely or frequently used as tools for research, there is not a significant body of literature in architectural history on models or on their scholarly applications. In describing these three collections and the projects associated with them, you will note that I have raised more questions than I have answered. This reality highlights the significant ambiguity that exists with regard to digitally enabled archival processing and access. To date, the field has spent much time and effort digitizing archival collections and building web-based interfaces to access them. We have spent far less time reflecting on how the increasing digitization of the archive is influencing the practice of art and architectural history or other allied fields. Thus, I would uh, argue that spending concerted time and effort to identify unknowns and articulate questions is a critical part of the process, along with devising strategies for tackling these unknowns. These are the tasks my team seeks to fulfill. We want to understand the intersections between archival processing, developments in technical imaging, in construction of user interfaces, in data creation and management, and in the practices of art and architectural history. Our goal is to help in aligning the needs of these fields as much as possible, so that each is not in tension with, but is coordinated with the other. In the time that remains, I will articulate a few broader observations my team has learned from these and from other projects. 
Recognizing these trends has helped us focus our efforts to understand how collections are evolving in the digital age. The first observation I want to make is that we have to acknowledge the incredible increase in scale and scope of these collections, but also consider what this increase really means. The three collections I discussed, the Zaman and Gary archives, as well as Ruscha's Streets of Los Angeles archive, illustrate in clear terms how archival acquisitions at the GRI have grown exponentially over just the course of a few years. Even more than this, these collections have, I hope, demonstrated the implications this increase in scale has for all stages of archival processing and access. Scale is, of course, a key difference between museum and archival collections. At the Getty, for example, the number of artworks in the museum numbers in the tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands if you count the individual pages of composite works, like photo albums. The GRI's archive, in contrast, contains billions of objects. While this kind of significant difference in scale will always distinguish museum from archival collections, I would argue that questions of scale will be increasingly relevant in both contexts. Indeed, this trend towards large scale and diversity of scope in archives and in museums will only continue and intensify. One reason is quite simply the advent of personal computing. Individuals can now, with their laptops, phones, and other devices, create, store, and retrieve ever-growing amounts of information. Uh, as you can see here from this image of my own laptop, which maybe like yours is full of JPEGs and other documents. This naturally means that the artists, designers, and scholars whose archives we are requiring are able themselves to compile larger collections of information. This also means that the scholars using these collections can capture much more information as part of their research than ever before. It is now routine for a scholar to bring her phone to the archive, for example, and snap photos of each document she consults. This leads me to my second observation. One result of this increasing scale is a growing burden being placed on the researcher with regard to search and discovery. Historically, the finding aid or even the library catalog were tools that researchers used to gain access to physical objects. Although information in the finding aid might be scant or even at times inaccurate, because the researcher would ultimately be looking at the original physical item, there was a higher tolerance for error or incompleteness in the finding aid. Consulting the physical item would likely tell the researcher everything she needed to know. Increasingly, however, a researcher may be accessing archival materials in digital-only form and may be navigating an entire collection at once rather than only a few boxes at a time. As my team discovered with the Zeman Digital Seminar, the finding aids utility decreases significantly in this scenario. Moreover, finding aids are simply less detailed than they used to be. In 2005, Mark A. Green and Dennis Meisner recognized what they called the quote unquote massive backlog of unprocessed archival collections. In an article in the journal The American Archivist, Green and Meissner called on their colleagues to, quote, rethink the way they process collections, particularly large contemporary collections, unquote. They advocated an approach in which archives are processed more rapidly by, for example, spending less time on description of items or collections. Priority is instead placed on making the physical items accessible to researchers as quickly as possible. Given the growing size of collections and the incredible backlogs at most institutions, this approach, which they called more product, less process, is understandable and likely inevitable. Regardless, the approach has been widely embraced in the archival field. As a result, archives have less metadata associated with them than ever before. This means there is simply less information that can be used to search collections whether in an online archival catalog or in person. 
This also means that finding items within archives is arguably becoming more difficult than it has in the past. Researchers must look through larger collections, which are described in broader terms and at ever higher levels. In addition, the notes and images they collect during their archival research become part of their own personal archives of data. These personal archives containing Microsoft Word documents, paper notes, digital images, and photocopies, among other formats, carry their own additional challenges for the researcher with regard to organization storage and retrieval. Indeed, my third observation is that because of this increased burden on the scholar for search and discovery, it has become useful and even necessary for them to think of archives as data rather than only as collections of documents. That is, scholars must be knowledgeable and critical users of the digital data that increasingly constitutes the archives they research, including the metadata that describes collections. Reconceptualizing archives as collections of data does not, however, mean thinking only in digital terms or thinking of them only as data. In his 2017 article on a collections as data imperative, librarian Thomas Padilla argues that, quote, an orientation to collections as data is about cultivating perception that pushes past the surface of the things that inhabit digital environments, unquote. I would add that it is also about cultivating a perception that considers the digital elements, the metadata, for example, that is associated with non-digital entities, such as documents. Thus, what I'm advocating is a vision of the archive as a collection of both data and documents, each of which requires different and yet interrelated forms of engagement, ordering, analysis, and interpretation. One format does not replace the other, rather, each extends the other. Moreover, I believe that, for the reasons I've outlined, approaching the archive as a collection of data and documents will increasingly be a necessity rather than a choice. While it will be important for researchers to gain a facility with data, there are additionally things that repositories like the GRI can do to help create a more easily usable and sustainable ecosystem of data and documents. The GRI, like many of its partner institutions, is focused more and more on adopting, developing, and refining standards for data storage and retrieval. We spend less time on developing the perfect platforms or applications for that data. This means, for example, that we are more interested in creating reliable, open, and usable data about our collections than we are in creating, for example, the perfect online collections catalog. Of course, we will always seek to improve our collections catalogs, but if our data is reliable, open, and usable, it can travel in and out of these systems more easily. This creates a more sustainable framework for creating and managing data, not only for repositories like the GRI, but for the individual researchers who access them. In the case of images, for example, we are employing the International Image Interoperability Framework, or IIIF, to facilitate image storage and delivery to user interfaces, like the prototype interface developed for the Zaman and Rocher collections. The IIIF standard is based on an approach where an image of an artwork or archival document is stored in one place along with its associated metadata. To access the image, users simply point to that image virtually. There is no need for them to download the image to their laptop. As a result, if an institution takes a new photo of an item, for example, or updates the metadata associated with it, this information is automatically updated for the user. In a sense, IIIF works like a television signal, broadcasting images to researchers who tune in to the ones in which they are interested. In addition, any image that is stored and made accessible using this standard can be brought together in a single IIIF-compliant viewer. 
by adhering to this international standard, we increase the likelihood that the best possible images of our collections are circulating, along with the most high quality, up-to-date information about the objects depicted. In addition, because scholars are pointing to images and not downloading them, they do not have to manage a bunch of image files on their own computer hard drives. At the GRI, we are also experimenting with strategies for data provenance so that scholars can more clearly understand where the data about our collections comes from. This will be increasingly important as we use computational methodologies to generate metadata, as we are doing for the geospatial information for the Streets of Los Angeles collection. In addition, because of the more product, less process approach, there is increasing interest in asking scholars to contribute metadata collections on which they have expertise as they are consulting them. For example, a scholar consulting an archive of correspondence could tag specific letters with information about who sent them, who received them, or who was mentioned in them. Such methods may be increasingly necessary in order to make items within our growing archives discoverable. But whether metadata is created by a cataloger, a computer, or an expert researcher, we will want to communicate to users of the archive where this information came from. This vision of an ecosystem of more diverse kinds of data generated through a wider variety of methods helps further illustrate the need for scholars to become literate in data itself, what it means, where it comes from, and how to use it. Zeman's 1969 exhibition, When Attitudes Become Form, presented a significant challenge to conventional notions of curation, art exhibition, the art object, and artistic practice. An analogous transformation is occurring in archival and in museums collections practice. The traditional approaches to processing predicated on physical access only will soon no longer be sufficient on their own as a means of managing and using archives. The issues I've outlined today are perhaps most obvious in the context of modern and contemporary collections. However, many of the same arguments could be applied to those from earlier periods. The challenges of archival collections are certainly not limited to those, to compile, to those compiled since the 1970s. These challenges result from the changing ways in which we all acquire, store, and retrieve information in our daily lives. It is this fundamental transformation of information management and access that, I believe, has the greatest potential to reshape not only collections themselves, but the practice of art and architectural history. Thank you.